Thank you for having me. Thank you, Karen, for having me. Thank you for, uh, for reaching out to me that day. And, and you know, as she mentioned, I'm just honored to be here. I'm, I'm very purpose-driven. Uh, I believe in uh, you know, just serving something greater than myself, serving others, serving a, a higher purpose that others benefit from. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to come here and, and share not just my experience here with you, but also learn from, from everybody here in this room, because I find that, or at least I, I tend to, to, to believe that everybody here in this room shares a very similar motivation, and that's to serve a, a purpose you know, higher, higher than yourself. I want to start this whole speech out with the fact that I'm going to share a lot of you know, my journey from the military, um, but I want to caveat that with it's not just unique to the military, right? And so I ask that you, you know, whatever bias or judgments or opinions that, they ha that you have about U.S. military or anything regarding the military, for example, the military here isn't, isn't, isn't the point of the story. It's really the lessons and the, and the trajectory throughout the military, which I just happen to serve in, but you can apply it to any and any other role or industry that you that you serve in. I'm also going to apologize for disappointing your impression of what a Navy SEAL should look like. I'm sure you see him on TV and in the movies, seven feet tall, ripped. That's just not me. I, had to, I happen to wear a purple shirt. I'm 180 pounds. That's what I am. So that's part joke, by the way. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about roadblocks. When I think of roadblocks, there are physical roadblocks. Say you suffer an injury, um, you can't run as well as you once did. There are mental roadblocks, you know, it's the self-talk that you tell yourself that you can or you shouldn't do this, that you're good, that you're not good enough. And then there are the emotional roadblocks, the fear, which actually determines the mental roadblocks. And when I think of fear, there's really two types of fear. There's good fear which keeps you alive. This is, the, this is the fear that tells you not to walk in front of a moving car in traffic. That's good. And then there's the bad fear. This is the, the bad fear that tells you you're no good to do X, Y, Z. I'm not going to have this conversation with this coworker because it'll be difficult and I won't get across the right message. I'm not good enough to, to, to start this new project. I'm not good enough to speak, blah, 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 all this other stuff. That's bad fear. Good fear keeps you alive. The bad fear keeps you from living. And those are the roadblocks. So let's talk about living. Ever since I was in high school, ever since I was 17, 18 years old, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Actually, I knew what I didn't want to do. I knew, I knew that I didn't want to stand in front of audiences wearing a purple shirt, giving speeches, or do any of that. That was not cool to me at the time. I'm totally good with that now. But back then, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to jump out of planes and blow things up. <laughs> and I wanted to be the best at it. So I figured SEALs were it. This is the happiness scale. Very simple. I'm very simple-minded. The higher on the scale, happier I am, lower, sadder, more depressed I am. So when I was in high school, at 17, 18 years old, I knew without a shadow of a doubt what I wanted to do. And it was just one thing. It was to be a SEAL. So I went to enlist after high school, and I couldn't because I had this physical roadblock that strangely never appeared beforehand, and it never appeared since. I had this skin irritation on my wrist that prevented me from enlisting. The doctor didn't know if it was contagious or not, so he said, sorry, Jeff, you can't, we can't let you in the Navy. So my spirits were shot. It's like, what am, what am I going to do? I'm going to be a SEAL. I don't, know about, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm going to be a SEAL at some point. Turned out that roadblock set me off to college because I didn't have really any other alternatives after that. So I went to college after that, and I quickly realized that, you know what, college isn't that bad. <laughs> college at Ohio State was a pretty good time. I graduated in three and a half, <clears throat> excuse me, three and a half years because I was dead set on my purpose, and that was to become a SEAL. However, my roadblocks in the way Along the way, they never subsided. My desire to be a, a SEAL never subsided. The roadblocks along the way never subsided. In my sophomore year in college, I had something called an exercise-induced anaphylactic reaction. I'll slow it down. It's a really sexy way of saying that I can eat parsley and celery, but if I eat parsley and celery and then work out right afterwards, if I elevate my heart rate, 
that I wind up in the hospital with my blood pressure 60 over 40 like I did this day in college. When that happens, I saw a couple doctors. First one was a heart doctor. He saw the world, he, he had his perspective through the world of heart. So when he saw me, he said, oh, Jeff, there's no way you can be a SEAL. Your blood pressure was 60 over 40 in the hospital. How are you going to make it through SEAL training? That was not the answer that I wanted to hear. But it was his perspective, right? That's the only way that he saw the world was through heart. I saw another doctor. I saw a couple other doctors, actually. The ultimate doctor that I saw was an allergy doctor. And she ultimately determined that it wasn't my heart, it wasn't my thyroid, it wasn't my lungs. You were just allergic to parsley and celery. That's it. So what do you do? Don't eat parsley or celery. <laughs> Pretty simple. And so in, the, in April of 2000, I enlisted in the Navy, finally. After three and a half years of college, I went through, enlisted, and I found myself six months later in BUDS. BUDS is an acronym for Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL Training. It's widely considered the toughest military training on Earth. Attrition rate is roughly 85%. We started with 176 students in our class, graduated roughly, actually we did graduate 34. The third week of BUDS is Hell Week. It's five and a half days of constant, nonstop conditioning. You are cold, wet, tired, and miserable for five and a half days. You sleep for four hours the entire week. The good news is you can quit at any point. BUDS is 100% voluntary. You can quit at any time. The bad news is, if you quit, then you can't be a SEAL. No caveat there, right? Well, every four hours or so in Hell Week, you have a medical check by a doctor to ensure that whatever injuries you have aren't debilitating, they're not going to last you the, the rest of your life, because at that point, you're probably not thinking too clearly. And I would venture to say that you're probably not thinking too clearly for even joining this program to begin with. But every four hours or so, you, you have a check, and as I as I walk up to the doctor for what I knew was going to be my, my last med check, literally hopping up to him like that because I couldn't walk on my right leg. My roadblock at that point was physical. I had a femoral stress fracture in my right leg, and it prevented me from walking. I couldn't walk on it. And so there were really two options. Not for me, but for the doctor. My fate was in their hands. One, I was going to be dropped from the course altogether because I couldn't perform. Or two, I'd be rolled back to day one. They would let my leg heal, and then I would go through it again. Not ideal, but that's what happened. I was not happy as a result of that. At the same time, that roadblock, that, that physical roadblock that I just had no control over, right? that roadblock was the one of the best things that ever happened to me. It was absolutely awesome. Because what that did was allowed me to forge the resilience, forge the grit, forge the mental capacity and fortitude to come back the second time even stronger and help those around me elevate their game. It's one of the best things that ever happened to me, that roadblock. Finally graduated BUDS, went to SEAL Team 4, did two deployments there before I screened for another SEAL team. This particular SEAL team called Naval Special Warfare Development Group has a very similar selection process to that of BUDS. It's six months, but on an, an operational level. Attrition rate is slightly lower, still high. To put it into perspective, if SEALs are the top 1% of, 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 of the Navy, Dev Group is the top 1% of SEALs. Somehow I made it through that. There's cracks in every system. That's, that's a joke, by the way. Sorry. So I did another six deployments there. I had a total of eight, eight deployments. And on my fourth deployment, my second with Dev Group, um, without going in, into the details, uh, I get shot. I get shot three times in the rail of my rifle, uh, one time in the lower left chest plate that you see, you see there along with my, with my shooting buddy, who I'll just refer to as Jay. Jay was my good luck charm, believe it or not. You'll see Jay again. That was the third week of a three and a half months long deployment. 
about a month and a half later, we're conducting a, a raid on, on another, another place, and uh, we lose our first teammate. Real name was Mark Carter. We called him Badger because he was short and hairy, <laughs> among other things. But we lost him on, on a mission one night. We come back from that deployment, and when you get back from deployments, you immediately begin training for, for the next deployment. And as the acronym of SEAL suggests, you, know, you train across the sea, the air, and the land. And this particular training evolution that we're doing that I'm about to share with you is in the air. We're doing some skydiving. There's, there's HALO, which is high altitude, low opening. That's when you jump out of a plane, pull your ripcord between three and 5,000 feet, and land somewhere. And then there's hey ho which is high altitude, high opening. It's when you jump out, pull your ripcord after a four second delay, and navigate to a target roughly 15 to 20 miles away at night through the air and then link up with the rest of the team. I know it's something everybody does on the weekend, no big deal. <laughs> this particular day is we're doing some halo. And my parachute doesn't open not once, but twice in the same day. And it doesn't matter who packed it. It doesn't, people often ask me, Jeff, you gotta not pack your parachutes. It wasn't me. It wasn't, well, it wasn't just me. I packed my parachutes. I had professional riggers pack my parachutes. Didn't matter. That's just my dumb luck. But suffice to say, I had some mental roadblocks after that. I had some mental roadblocks after that. How do you, how do you bounce back from that? That was on day one. This was a week long jump trip. How do you bounce back from that? Right? Because the next day, I gotta jump. And if I don't jump, then that's essentially quitting. What I found since I left the Navy is that there are really two things, two things that really determine one's why. You know, you've all heard of probably Simon Sinek's stuff on research on start with why, you know, that's the that's the compulsion for why you do what you do. But there are really two things that inform your why, at least that I found. One is the mission. It's the purpose that you serve. It's what you, it's, it's what you do. It's what you serve. It's the ultimate end state, the value that you provide. And it's also the people that you work with, the people to your left and, and your right. What you serve and who you serve it with, those are the two that inform your why. And when one of those change, for me, so too did and does your why. My why didn't change here. However, I did have that mental roadblock, that damn mental roadblock. Man, is my parachute not gonna open again? How do, you, how do you navigate through that? Well, how do you face any fears? How do you face fears? Actually, how do you get rid of fears? You face them. You gotta show up the next day. Show up the next day and tackle that roadblock and keep jumping. It's that simple, but it's also that difficult. While we're training, other teams are, are deployed, and we experience a whole just onslaught of, of tragedy. We lose teammate after teammate after teammate. And then we go on another training evolution, this time in Arizona, and uh, we lose our troop chief on a night hey-ho jump. I go back on deployment, this time in 2008, I want to say, which turns out to be the worst deployment because I lose my best friend. And I come home with Josh's body midway through deployment to conduct the funeral services in Arlington, and I get word that we lose two more teammates while I'm back home with Josh. So I redeploy back to where we were, finish out that deployment, and then come back to the States, begin training again, go on deployment again in, I think, 2009, early 2010, and I get shot again. This time hurt. The first time wasn't that bad. This time hurt. This time I got shot in the forearm, chest, and shoulder. Talk about some roadblocks. Physical, emotional, mental, they just keep piling up. But my why didn't change. My why did not change. I was still serving the mission. I was still serving with the, with the people beside me. There's nothing else that I wanted to do, nothing. So to me, those roadblocks didn't, didn't even exist. I was down for about a month. I spent about a month recovering before I was, I was back. And my team is out conducting some more training, more jumping. 
So I'm like, all right, put me in, coach. I'm ready to go. I want to get out there and jump with you guys. I like jumping. I don't anymore, but I did at the time. So what happens? Two more cutaways. Two more times my parachute didn't open. I can't even make this up. I'm not even that creative. Two more times my parachute didn't open, and again, it didn't matter who packed my parachute. I packed it. Professional riggers packed it. That's just my dumb roadblock luck. But every single time, every single time, I got better. I got stronger, and so did the guys with me. While we're training, again, other teams are forward deployed. I lose another great teammate. Go on deployment again, come back, lose another great friend. Go on deployment again in 2011, which is a really great deployment. And then a few months later, Extortion 17 gets hit by a lucky RPG. Then I come back, have my son, which is by far one of the best things, probably actually is the absolute best thing that ever happened to me. Left the command that I was at, went to the West Coast to train West Coast SEALs and tactics and techniques before they deployed. And then I got out, uh, got into management consulting, helped organizations adapt, uh, adapt to change. And then I got divorced, which was actually one of the best things, the second best thing that ever happened to me. You see where it is on the happiness scale there. And then here I am today sharing these lessons, not just from business, but or from, from military, but, but business as well. But the reason I share this with you is that this isn't really, really unique to me, right? Yeah, it has a military story in it, but if you take this, or if you take your own role, you know, your own job function, your responsibilities, the industry that you work in, and you apply the peaks and valleys, the roadblocks that you've experienced, and we chart them, and we put them up on this slide, I guarantee the peaks and valleys are going to look very, very similar. Minus the shots, minus the cutaways, hopefully minus all the, all the funerals, they're still roadblocks, right? They're still emotional roadblocks, they're still physical roadblocks, they're still mental roadblocks. The question is, what are you willing to do today to navigate through them? As, a, as an individual and as a team. So there are a number of lessons that I want to share with you as a result of you know, this stuff. I have a lot of them. We only have time for three of them today. We're going to start with telling yourself the right story. You know, I referenced self-talk in the, in the beginning. Self-talk is that voice that pops in your head when you're, when you're really good at something or, or when you're not so good at something. When that fear injects itself into your head. And say, for example, I know public speaking is, is, a, is a common fear. I used to hate public speaking. I hated it. I had that fear. I had that self-talk come in my mind and say, man, I'm just not good at this. I was telling myself the wrong story. Your brain will find the answer to any question you pose to it. It doesn't know what's real. It doesn't know what's not real. But it'll find the answer to any question you pose to it. Every week in BUDS, we have three timed evolutions. We have a four-mile timed run. We have an obstacle course that we have to pass. And we have a two-mile ocean swim. And as BUDS progresses, the passing times for those evolutions lower. So you have to constantly be getting better. And if you're not getting better, or if you, pa if you fail any of those evolutions, then you're given a makeup opportunity. You you're given a second chance. And if you fail any of those evolutions a second time around, then you're dropped altogether. There are performance standards that need to be met. And if you're not meeting them, then you can't, you can't be a part of the program. Well, we had a historically slow swimmer, who I'll just name Baker. He was always slow. He was either last or second to last on the swim, but it didn't really matter where you finished in the swim, just so long as you finished it, in the time allotted. Well, there's one swim in third phase of BUDS. That was awful. It was awful. Conditions by any stretch of, of, of any imagination, we should not have been in that water. It was wavy, it was windy, conditions were terrible. There are no boats on the water, which is pretty telling in San Diego. We should not have been swimming. But we did, because there are performance standards that we need to uphold. 
Passing time, I think, for two miles in the ocean is 75 minutes at that point in buds. We go out and we conduct the swim. We wrap it up, we change out of our wetsuits and then begin prepping for the next evolution, which is a classroom. So we change into our uniforms uh, to go sit in the classroom. And before the class begins, an instructor comes in. Not the one who's going to teach the class, but the phase instructor. He's kind of like the head honcho. He comes in, and he walks up to the front, and he's like, Baker, get up here. So Baker's like, what? Baker runs up, and the instructor looks at Baker. He's like, Baker, you failed. Do it again. So Baker's like, what? He doesn't necessarily say that, but that's what he's feeling. You know, the wind is taken out of the sails. He's got to go swim that same two-mile ocean swim that he just failed. I'm going to say that one more time because it's important. Think about this in the, in the context of a mental roadblock. If Baker doesn't go past the same two-mile ocean swim that he just failed, then he can't be a seal. He's in third phase of buds. He can see the light at the end of the tunnel. He knows that if he passes this swim and all other sub subsequent swims like he has so far, then he's going to reach his dream. The instructors know this too. The instructors know that the students in third phase are generally the ones that, are, that they are going to have to work with. Think about this predicament. As I mentioned, the conditions haven't changed, right? The ocean is still not ideal. Still high winds, still high current, still high waves. But if Baker doesn't go out and pass the same two-mile ocean swim that he just failed, then he's done. So Baker grabs his swim buddy. He's got to suffer along with him. And they go out and they conduct the swim while we're in the classroom. As the class wraps up, roughly an hour, hour or so later, Baker comes in. And he's still in his wetsuit. He's got his fins, his mask. And he's emotionally distraught, to say the least. He's not a happy camper. He's 18 years old. And quite frankly, he's acting his age. And he's slowing us down as a class. Our next evolution after the class is the obstacle course. So we need to change out of our uniform, get into some other gear, and go run the O course. So we're like, Baker, hurry up, man. You're slowing us down. Let's go. The instructor sees this again. And he comes back in. And he goes, Baker, get over here. So Baker runs up. The instructor looks at Baker. And he's like, Baker, I'm going to make you do it again if you don't clean up your act. You're cold, you're wet, you're tired, you're feeling miserable, and you're feeling sorry for yourself. You're worried that you're going to show up to the O course less than what you're capable of showing up at. You just swam two miles. You failed. If I go out in town right now and I ask any person in town to do what you just did, do you think they would do that? No. You just fought a battle with yourself that most people lose, and that's the battle with your mind. Now get out here and run the O course. By the way, you pass the swim. So Baker runs out, and he runs his fastest O course time ever. After having swam double, after having overcome that resistance, that self-defeating self-talk that told him he wasn't capable of passing it. He goes out and he runs his fastest O course time ever. The conditions never changed. What changed was how Baker showed up. He made a decision. He made a choice to show up differently the second time. And it was all in his mind. He had the capacity. right? He had the physical capacity. It wasn't, there wasn't the emotional stress. There wasn't the, the fear associated with any sort of emotional roadblock. It was a complete mental roadblock. See, the first time that he showed up for that swim, he showed up with his own story. We all tell ourselves the, our, our own stories. Oh, I'm not a good enough swimmer. I'm not a fast enough swimmer. I don't know if I can make this. Maybe I'll just save my energy and make it up next week. That's the story that he's telling himself. You think he's going to show up as a fast and capable swimmer if he is telling himself a different story? No. Now compare that with the second time where the consequences were graver. He showed up not with hope, because hope isn't a strategy. He showed up with a choice 
I need to pass the swim, and I need to do it now. His identity changed. First, his identity was that of a slow swimmer. And then his identity was that of a faster and capable swimmer. And it all happened, not because anybody gave him anything. Nobody showed him how to do, you know, what, so, I don't know, some people describe seals as having superhuman powers about, I don't know what those are. But Baker made a choice, and he chose how he showed up. How you see the problem oftentimes is the problem. And that leads us to number two. When I was going through all those sorts of physical roadblocks back in, back in high school and in college with those, with those doctors, I saw that one doctor that I shared with you who only saw the world through one perspective. He saw the world all circula circulating around the heart for the most part. And then I saw a couple other doctors, and they saw it through allergies. Others saw it through lungs. The point is they had one perspective. I had multiple perspective, perspectives because I was, see I was, I was seeing, seeing the range of perspectives from one, spectrum to an, one end of the spectrum to another. Let's do a quick demo. I think, I think this will be better highlighted with an example. I need one brave soul who doesn't have to come up here. You can sit in your seat, but one brave soul to help us think through a complex problem based on perspective. Who wants to do it? Any brave takers? <laughs> Not one? All right, awesome. Thank you. What's your name? Steven. Steven. Great. You can stay right there. This will be. So we have a challenge, all right? We have a cake. Let's just pretend this is a cake. And our goal here is to cut eight equal slices, but only do so with three cuts. Okay, so we can only make three cuts, but the end result is we need eight equal slices. How would we go about doing it? No, no pressure. <laughs> Any, you, can, you can tell me, you can just tell me if, how, how you want me to slice it, hypothetically. I know, I know. Cut it in half. First. Cut it in half. <laughs> There's one. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah, that's what everybody does. Right. Exactly. Exactly. What if? What if we change the perspective? How might how might we change it differently? Any other takers? Yes. Oh, look at that. Look at that. New perspective. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. This is, this is a hard one. I, I mean, I set it up that way, so thank you for, for uh, being brave and, 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 uh, and assuming that. The point is, perspectives matter, right? Different perspectives matter. There's a whole slew of research on cognitive diversity in a team and in groups. You know, you need cognitive diversity, yes. However, you can have as many cognitively diverse members as you can even you can imagine, but if the environment isn't psychologically safe for those different perspectives to share, right? If it, if it's if those people don't feel that it's safe to share their perspectives, then that cognitive diversity doesn't really matter. Perspective is about how you see the problem. Now let's get into how you solve it. Because seeing it and solving it are two different things, right? We have a similar riddle here, equation, problem solving. But the thing here is, perspective isn't, isn't, isn't going to change. Here we have six cups. Okay, we have three filled with milk, three that are empty. And our goal here is to move just one cup so that the cups are alternating. Milk, empty, milk, empty, milk, empty. We can only move one cup. What's that? Man, have you seen this presentation before? <laughs> He's got it. He's got it. Problem solving. Right? We wanted to move it. You pour it in, into another cup, right? Different ways to problem solve. Different perspectives, different problem solving techniques, heuristics. 
Now, let's say, let's say we want to tackle a complex problem, a complex challenge. What's, what's a challenge or, 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 or a goal that you guys want to achieve, say, for this quarter or, or this year? Just We're not going to necessarily get into it. We just want something to refer to. Let's say, how about, how about uh, be the global source for lymphoma facts and statistics? Be the global source, okay? That's our, that's the mission. There's a whole slew of potential solutions for how we're going to get there, right? But there's really just one, one solution that's ideal, and that is represented by the peak right here, by this mountaintop. Let's say we got one person working on that mission. It means we've got one perspective, right? That, that person only sees what's in front of him or her. They don't see what's beyond that mountain range. They don't see the pathways. You go up, you follow one path, it takes you up and down and around, then you come down, and oh my God, there's like a whole new mountain range there that I never saw before. It's a limited perspective, right? And then you want to enlist people who share the same values and the same beliefs that you do, but what happens when you, when you enlist similarity? They get to the same point that you are, right? Now, a different perspective, maybe that person lands on another mountain range, and he sees or she sees the same problem from a new light, and as a result, offers a new way to solve that problem. That brings everybody to the best possible solution. What I'm referring to here, as I mentioned before, is cognitive diversity. Now, there's plenty of diversity in this room. It's fantastic. It's awesome. Different cultures, different, different value systems. You, absolute, you, you already have something that most organizations are, are trying to create. You guys already have that. As I mentioned, though, cognitive diversity is only effective to, to the point that people are willing to speak up, to share information, and to share their perspectives. In the 80s, 90s, probably early 2000s, and even some today, people will say that knowledge is power. And I completely disagree. Completely. Knowledge is powerful, but sharing knowledge is the true source of power because it enables others to act. And when you allow others to act, that allows you to focus on what you and only you can affect. And that's how you stay optimal, and that's how you keep navigating roadblocks. You can have some brilliant minds, but who's on the team is less important than how that team works together. I learned this in BUDS. This is an awful evolution that I don't recommend for anybody called log PT. And it's, it's, it's brutal and it's very simple. Pick up a telephone pole, carry it around for four hours. That's what you do, that's log PT. It's awful. What you learn from log PT is that every, everybody wants, it, wants the, the, the strong guy in the class, everybody wants you know, the, 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 the students who, you know, are, who are built, who are, you know, can look like they can hold this telephone pole for an hour just on their own. What you learn is that strength doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter who's on the team, it matters how that team works together. Because you can have, you can have the strongest person in the class holding up this log, but if, you, if he's holding up that log, it's actually adding more weight on the other end to other people on the other on the receiving end. Or then yet or you might have people who are contributing more so than others. It's not an equal distribution of effort. Right? There is a research uh, experiment called the marshmallow experiment ex experiment. Different than the one on discipline. And this experiment looked at, at two different groups. The first group looked at MBA students. And the purpose for each group was to construct a fixture comprised of dried up spaghetti, string, tape, and a marshmallow. So using those four items, create a fixture with the marshmallow on top. And whoever would create that fixture would be the winner. The first group that tried this was a group of MBA students. Brilliant kids, right? Brilliant minds. They asked brilliant questions. They came up with uh, a brilliant blueprint that they would follow. And at the end, they would construct this awesome fixture and they lost, and they lost to a group of kindergartners. <laughs> they lost to a group of five and six-year-olds, why? Because the five and six-year-olds weren't trying to be MBA students. 
They're trying to manage their social status. MBA students, they were worried about how they're going to show up. They were worried about asking silly questions about, about who they need to influence so they can be the influencer, about, about offending the, the people in their group. Whereas the five and six-year-olds, they're just worried about the task. Move this here, cut that here, tape that, put the marshmallow on top. It's how they worked. This same experiment was run with a group of CEOs, a group of lawyers, a group of administrative assistants, who, by the way, performed the best out of the adult groups. And the kindergartners beat them all. Why? Because they weren't trying to manage their social status. It doesn't matter who's on the team. It matters how the team works together. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about trust in a team. And I know everybody, everybody knows how important trust is. We gotta build trust, we gotta create trust. Think about your daily behaviors, about your own daily actions and what you actually do as leaders to build trust. Because that is the number one priority for any leader, at least in my mind. It's to build trust. Build trust with other institutions. Build trust with your colleagues, stakeholders and build trust within yourself. When you go home at night, for example, actually, before I get there, let me ask you this. Is trust earned or is it given? Both? Both? Well, that's a safe answer. Yes, I would, agree, I would agree. I lean more towards it being given. The reason is, when you drive home at night, there's a, there's a car in the opposite lane, right? We don't know that driver. We don't know that car. We don't know what that person's intentions are or the, the functionality of that car, its maintenance record. But if we don't give that person trust, then we can't get ahead. All right? We can't get to our destination if we don't give that person trust. We don't know anything about them, but we gotta give it to them so that we can get to where we wanna be. And the same is true when we board an airline. All right? We don't know anything about the pilots, but we trust two things about them. We trust their competence that we know that they know what all those bright shiny buttons do, and we trust their character. We trust that they're not going to nose dive the plane into the ground. Character and competence. How many times have you boarded a plane and stuck your nose in the cockpit and be like, "Hey, you all done this before?" <laughs> right? <laughs> one, always one. <laughs> Did you know that 74 percent of airline mishaps happen when flight crews assemble together for the first time? 74%, that's pretty scary, right? But how many of us stick our faces in the cockpit? Y'all done this together? No, we just assume, we give it to them. What we don't do is learn how to give ourselves trust because how many times, how many promises do you make to others that you keep versus promises that you make to yourself? It's easier to make promises and keep promises that we make to others. I'll be there at seven o'clock. I'll pick you up at eight. Yeah, I'll be there on time. I'll order this for you. Versus the self-trust that we make to ourselves. I'm gonna get up at 6 a.m., I'm gonna get on the treadmill, I'm gonna eat better, and then it doesn't last. That's the self-trust. All business is based on trust, because they're based on relationships, and re relationships Relationships are the governing body of business. People do business with others whom they like, know, and trust. I wasn't gonna share this with you, but it makes sense. And I've, I've had a lot of inquiries about after action reviews, so I figured, why not? I shared a number of different lessons with you. You know, how you see the problem is the problem. Tell yourself the right story. Earn and give trust. But how do you bring that all together? You know, how do you bring this together as a coalition, you know, as, as one complete entity? Well, there is something that we did in the military called after action reviews. And, and after action review was something we did after every training evolution, after every mission to assess three things. We wanted to identify what we intended to happen, right? What was, what was the purpose that we set out to achieve? What actually happened when we were there? And then what caused the difference between the two? What do we intend to achieve? What actually happened? And then what caused the difference between the two? This last one, 
This last question, what caused the difference, is where learning occurs. And learning is what keeps, is what drives competitive advantage today. I often say that organizations compete at the speed of adaptability, but they adapt at the speed of learning. This is what you use to institutionalize not just that learning, but that adaptability that allows you to stay competitive. There's got to be a space created for learning. If you leave it up to one person or, or even to yourself to, to manage it at the end of the day, it's never going to happen. It's just never going to happen, right? Priorities come in. There's no time. I hear that all the time. It just has to be institutionalized. Folks, that's all I got for, for today.